Hi, Arjen. Hi, Martin. Hi, hi. hi. Um, how are you? Uh, all good. All good. Thank you very much. Sounds yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, of course, a news question. Uh, you as guitarist, um, Eddie van Halen passed away. Uh, he was born in, in, in the Netherlands too, just, just like you. And no, um, he, he's actually uh, related somehow. He's yeah. part of the... Yeah, we are related. Uh, an uncle of me told me, oh, Jan van Halen, I know him, and he's uh, my nephew. So there is some kind of a relationship, yeah. <laughs> okay. And do you otherwise feel connected playing the guitar? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a total example for me. He, uh, he was the best rhythm guitar player ever. And Van Halen, one, had the best guitar sound ever. So, yeah, he was a huge, huge influence. I loved Van Halen. Can you say influence what in what kind of way did he influence you uh, most of all guitar sound his, his sound on the first album i never heard a better sound than that you know and it was so easy just a guitar and amp and a mic and how he did it i have no idea so sound wise then of course you had his tapping technique which you never heard of before and it was how does he do it and then you find out how he does it and uh, but but also just the songs you know and and together with david lee roth it was it was magic you know those two yeah um, well, his lifestyle wasn't that 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 great. I think uh, for most, I, except for the last ten years, I think prior to that, yeah. he lived a rock and roll lifestyle. Um, was it something that attracted you too when you when you when you started the the rock and roll lifestyle? Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> you know, we uh, we were all guilty, in the, especially in the eighties. It was a terrible time. It was yeah. before AIDS and stuff like that, and and uh, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh, cliches. You know, uh, we've been through them all. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was a heavy time. Yeah, people credited him for well being the instigator of hair metal. Um, what do you think of that? Van Halen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, really, a copycat being a copycat. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. That's, yeah, that's, okay. That, that's yeah. flamboyant. That 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 fun. That that that. But he was the yeah. master, of course. But that people... it could, could be. Yeah. He put the humor in music. I think that was very important, especially David Lee Roth, of course. You know, with Sammy Hagar, it was a little bit less humor. Yeah. But um, yeah, hair metal. I, I think of Motley Crue and Poison and, and Rat and all these these kind of bands. Yeah, but he but he but he influenced them. I think they they were. Oh yeah, sure. Oh oh yes. Oh yeah. But he influenced everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who didn't he influence? You know. Yeah. Um, do you rate him as the same as like well, some some people say that that he is well on the same level maybe uh, if you look at influence like Jimi Hendrix do you agree? Yeah, I, I totally totally agree. First there was Hendrix, uh, then there was like Blackmore, Jeff Beck, and and uh, and then Van Halen. Absolutely, you know. And after Van Halen came Ingrid Malmsteen, Steve Vai, and all those guys are are in the top ten. You know, absolutely. Okay. Well. Um, Thanks and Joe Satriani, of course, yeah, who yeah, yeah, is yeah. my new album, so there's yeah. a nice link. <laughs> nice link, it's true. Um, Joe Satriani, you you mentioned him, but uh, there's also Marty Friedman on your album, but we will... We, right, right. Yeah, we will... We Get will, to that later. Yeah, we will discuss it later. Um, first of all, you've, you've, you've released many albums now since 1995. Um, what can you say? What did you bring from those previous albums? What, what did you learn, maybe, and... and, and, and that ended up now on this album because you started out with oh, uh, well a lot. Yeah, yeah. The, the first Ariel and Ariel and album was very clumsy. <laughs> you know, a rock opera should have like different characters, you know, and different singers for different characters. But like on the first Ariel and album, there was the character Ariel and the character Merlin, and it was character Arion was like four different singers, you know, and I had no explanation for that, just that that I didn't know how to do it. And I just knew a few guys and 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 so yeah, it was clumsy. And then the second Arion album was uh, was not a big success because it wasn't the concept album. It was really uh, very experimental. So that was my lesson too. Okay, you know, don't make it too different. <laughs> you know, stick stick to what people like of you, which is a rock opera with loads of guest singers and loads of different styles of music. Yeah. And then with the third album, Electric Castle, I hit the jackpot. You know, uh, uh, that's really that was really my breakthrough. I think also because I had like great musicians like like Fish of Marillion on it and Anik uh, and Thijs van Leer and etc. But okay. that was the start, yeah. That was the but start. can you say that 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 
the third elm things fell fell more into place for you uh, regarding uh, concept albums everything. I think everything every I made all the right choices there with uh, yeah the, I, especially the cover art I think that was very important <laughs> it was a real oil, oil painting you know not someone noodling around on a computer it was a real painting that someone worked on for months and and it had so many details just like my music and it was a fantasy story. Uh, th there was a, a clear story with an ending and, and there were clear characters, you know, kind of like stereotypes, the Roman and the barbarian, you know, and yeah. <laughs> it was all done tongue in, tongue in cheek because I myself played the part of the hippie. And uh, uh, I'm glad I did that, you know, so people don't take me, I don't want to be taken too serious, you know, it's, it's, uh, if people call me cheesy, I'm like, sure, man. That's true. <laughs> sure. Um, well, then if you if you look, and then uh, uh, the, al the albums following into the Electric Castle, um, how do you look back on those albums before we come to this new album? Uh, it's, it's funny. If I look back at the history of Arion, I see uh, an album that uh, people like and an album where I'm taking risks. It's always been like that. First album, Final Experiment. I didn't expect anyone to like it. That's why it's called Final Experiment. I thought it would be my final experiment. But people loved it. Then I made Actual Fancy. It was a risk. Uh, you know, it was... Uh, uh, people didn't expect it, so it didn't sell so well. Then I made uh, Into Electric Castle. Exactly what people wanted to hear, so it was a big success. Then I started experimenting again. Then I did yeah. the Universal Migrator, which was a heavy album and a soft album. I uh, I separated the styles and uh, people didn't get that, you know, why is it two albums and why are the styles separated? And then I learned like, okay, people like the mix of my music. I thought people who like heavy music don't want to hear those folky mandolin parts. <laughs> you know, people who, who like the, the prog stuff don't want to hear the metal stuff, but they liked it all. Yeah, yeah. So, so the whole, if you go through the whole Arian saga, it was, uh, I did uh, Human Equation. Everyone yeah. loved it. It was the rock opera that everyone expected. Then I did Theory of Everything, which was uh, four long tracks, and it was totally prog. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had members of Yes, Genesis, King Crimson, uh, Emerson and Palmer on it, and and it was 24 little parts, and people were confused. You know, so again, that was, yeah. and after that, I made Zero One, which people loved, yeah. and. Um, it's like the Star Trek movies. I think the Star Trek movies had this had the same, like <laughs> all the even movies people liked or something. Yeah. And uh, and now I make Transitus, which is again a risk yeah. album. You know, my previous album, The Source, everyone loved, sold like crazy. Yeah. Um, and this is my risk album again. So uh, it's good for me to have challenges. The risk album. What 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 started this risk album for you? Uh, well, basically, uh, firstly, it wasn't set up to be an aerial album. It was like fulfilling my all time dream, mm -hmm. which was making a movie. You know, I'm a huge movie fan, always been inspired by movies. So it was, uh, let's make my own movie. So this album is totally written as a soundtrack. So with each part of the music, I know exactly what should happen in the movie. So uh, it was a challenge, of course, because it's a different way of working. But then the whole Corona thing started and uh, and then you realize, okay, a movie costs millions, you know, you don't, yeah. even a low budget movie costs five million, whatever. So it's hard to get that kind of money together at this point. And also it's hard to film, you know, mass, mass scenes is with all the, all the restrictions. It's, it's really hard to do that. So then I, I went to the record company. I was like, well, I have this movie. I have the music. I don't want to keep it lying on the shelf until this is over. What do you guys think? And they uh, they said, well, it sounds like an Arion to us, you know. It's it's got all the components, it's got the uh, ingredients, it's got it's got the many singers, it's got the many different styles, it's got the story. So it became an Arion album. But is it for you? Um, did you actually had the movie, uh, the images in your head while writing the music, or did it come afterwards? Well, how how does it? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, which is different because because in the past. Uh, I started with the music. It was always first the music and then yeah. I let the music inspire me. I must have told you that before for, yeah. for, to come up with a story. Um, but uh, this time it was the other way around. I had a story in my head and I had to write the music to it. And that was, that was 
a challenge for me. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I, other way around, music just comes to you. Yeah. You know, but to write music for uh, a story is is much harder. What is the biggest difference then for you? For you, uh, you're not limited. When I just had come, let music come to me, I just record everything. I'm not limited at all musically. Yeah. But if I have a story, it's like, okay, I want to do a gothic uh, uh, horror story, a gothic ghost story, romantic ghost story set in the 19th century. Uh, I already limit myself. Like, okay, so I can't do this, so I can't do that. I have to do something like that. And to bypass that, I actually just started stealing <laughs> film music. <laughs> I just started listening to a lot of film music like Ennio Morricone, like John Carpenter. Uh, like Jerry Goldsmith, and just took these parts, and uh, which I usually never do, you know. Usually, I don't want to be influenced by by yeah. other music, but this time I was like, "Come on, influence me!" Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like 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 John Carpenter, you know, you got the ten and ten ten you know, from from uh, um, uh, now I lost the movie. Uh, Halloween, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which is iconic, you know. So I just took that part, and okay, how can I make it my own, and how can I change it so people won't uh, <laughs> won't think I st I stole it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it was a different way of working. But was it what what did it do to your cre creativity? Uh, I can imagine when sometimes when you limit yourself, sometimes it helps, but sometimes it doesn't help. Sometimes it 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 blocks more of your creativity. What what did it do for you? Uh, uh, in the beginning, it kind of blocked me because also the singers, um, uh, usually I pick a singer and I don't care what he looks like, you know, I just listen to the voice. But this time I also wanted the singers to be the actors in the movie. Yeah. So you have to look for, for singers that have charisma, that look good, that can act, that fit the part. Okay. And in the beginning, it was like, oh, my God, you know, so I can't ask this singer and I can't ask that singer. But then the challenge becomes the inspiration. Um, it, it's like, uh, OK, cool. So I got to find someone like that. And then you find him and then you find the other actors and you find all these actors. And that's that's when the inspiration comes. You know, that's why, like, OK, it was a challenge, but um, I, I, I did succeed in finding them. And why specifically this story? Uh, because uh, usually I do science fiction, of course. Uh, but if you do a movie, you're not going to make a science fiction movie under 50 million. <laughs> you know, these, I mean, the, these big budget movies, they cost over 200 million uh, euros. Um, so I was like, okay, sci-fi is going to be too difficult to make a movie of that. And what else do I like? Well, I've, I've always been, a, since since The Exorcist and The Omen and stuff like that, you know, I, I love those kind of uh, horror or ghost, also ghost movies, uh, like Poltergeist and stuff like that. And uh, um, yeah, that's when I thought, let's do a ghost movie, but a romantic ghost movie, not not as a, a splatter movie, you know, wherever, with, with, with violence and blood, that's not my thing. Uh, and of course, to set it in the 19th century, you know, where there are no smartphones, <laughs> I know that that's what I like. I, it's, it's kind of like a dark period, the Victorian age and, and the whole hammer horror stuff and, and uh, the, the cool colors of, uh, of movies of those days. And, um, what, what do you like about, uh, you said ghost movies, what, what do you like about those movies? Well, a lot of people think that I'm, I'm really a spiritual person, you know, who believes in all this stuff, but I don't. I'm the most skeptical person in the world. <laughs> it's terrible. You know, I'm a man of science. I believe in science. And, and the more we discover, the, the more we realize how little we know, basically. So uh, I love to fantasize about these things. You know, I don't, maybe if I would believe in them, that wouldn't be so interesting to me if, if I thought there'd be ghosts, but I love to fantasize about it. And I love the unseen. As I told before, you know, if people just kill each other with knives, a lot of blood, it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> fast forward, you know. But if you don't see it, that's when it's scary. I mean, Jaws is a good example. I mean, the, the, the shark didn't work, you know, <laughs> the mechanics were broke, so they couldn't show the shark. And that's why Jaws became such a great movie, you know, because you didn't see it. That was just a menace 
menace of, of, of the shark. Yeah. And I think that's what I like about ghost movies. Without giving away too much of the plot, um, what can you share uh, about the story? Because people have to listen to the album, of course, but... Well, it's a romantic ghost story set in the 19th century. It's, betw it's between uh, a love affair uh, between uh, a rich man's son, Daniel, and a poor black servant uh, who is called Abby. Uh, Daniel dies and everyone thinks that Abby killed him. So Daniel, he ends up in transitus, which is uh, like limbo, which is the, the realm between uh, life, life and death, where the angel of death will decide whether you go to the good place or to the bad place. And uh, the angel of death is kind of like the comical character in, in the story. And she kind of likes Daniel, you know, she's like, whoa, hello there, you know. <laughs> and she allows him to uh, go back to the world of the living for seven days and seven nights to uh, prove Abby's innocence. So right. that's the basis okay. of the story. It's not a happy story. <laughs> no, but it's 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 it, it has some elements that 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 you can smile about or you, that you can. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. There's yeah. some cheesy stuff in there, as as always in my. <laughs> uh, the songs, the songs are shorter. Uh, I, 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 is it true that the songs are? Is it it's lot? true. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I I hear a lot of fans complaining about that. Oh. Uh, they they're used to long progressive songs with long instrumental parts and complicated stuff. Uh, but yeah, if you do a movie, uh, that what are you going to do in the long instrumental parts where where it's complicated music, you know? Yeah. And and so there's there. If you look at Jesus Christ Superstar, I mean, my my favorite track is Pilot's Dream. You know, I dreamt I met a Galilean. It's I think it's one minute and thirty seconds or something. So yeah, uh, um, the movies they're like short scenes. You know, it, it's yeah. not like long 10 minute uh, instrumental songs so that's the reason for that was it was it for you uh was it was it a big difference in in writing that you had to well uh f focus yourself on, on on songs that are less less long than previously well usually you know it's it's like a misconception usually these epics you know if you take yes with close of the edge close to the edge which is like a whole side you know that's really 22 little songs, you know, if you look at it. And yeah, that's also yeah. the way it was recorded. Yeah. Yeah. They just recorded all these little parts. And then at the end, they said to the producer, hey, you glued them together. And in those days, it was hard, you know, you didn't have computers. So you had to splice tapes and cut them together. And uh, basically, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these epics of, of 20 minutes, is just, um, it's just a lot of short songs. Yeah. glued together and I could do that I, I actually did it on Transitus the first song is like 30 like 10 minutes and people say oh you got an epic but basically I shouldn't be saying this basically that's just six little parts that I glued yeah. together <laughs> no but it's that's it's 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 just the way how you present it more or less that's maybe. so important it's so yeah. important uh, if I go back to what I said about Electric Castle I presented it with this beautiful cover and it's all in the present presentation, or not all, but a lot in the presentation. I agree. What did you? Well, there, there's a, a guest list of of your many people. Let's start with the voice, uh, Tom Baker. Um, yes. What was the first time that you heard him, 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 him tell a, uh, tell uh, a story? Um, early seventies, you know, when when Doctor Who started. Uh, what, when was it? Must have been seventy three, seventy four. I don't know. Um, so I was 14 and I was glued to the TV. I mean, it all started with Star Trek for me. That That's my absolute uh, favorite TV series. But then I saw Doctor Who and I loved it so much. And I loved it mainly because of Tom Baker because he put so much humor yeah. in the part and he was so arrogant and he was so intelligent and he was just, and, and he always said he didn't play the part but he was the part and, and I met him now He's totally right. I mean, he's 86 and he's still that, he's still the doctor, you know, with, with, with the humor and with the glimmer in his eye. And, uh, what is it for you? Because, well, this, this, this whole project, uh, 10 albums of Arian, um, 
I think for you, the, 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 the list of people who, who you work with, now especially Tom Baker, it's something like, um, well, some sort of, for your personal life, some sort of dream come true, working with people that you admired maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Totally, totally. What, is it, what, 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 does, it, what does it give you? It's an addiction. It's uh, on the first album, it started with, I was a huge Golden Earring fan. You know, I mean, let's face it, Golden Earring is Holland's band number one and a huge Barry Hay fan. And I already knew him a little bit because of my days with Vengeance. He helped with lyrics. So I asked him for, for the final experiment for the first Aeroin album. And he said, yeah, man, sure. Okay, just give me a bottle of whiskey. And he came to the studio and I was so nervous, you know, there's, the guy you've been listening to with headphones in the dark for, for years singing my song. And, and uh, that was such, such an amazing feeling, you know, uh, first nervous and really almost, almost sick, you know, and then he left and then you got the result and the result is great. And that was the beginning of an addiction. That was like, I want more of this. Yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't care what it costs, you know, because some of these guys are expensive, you know, you, uh, which is logic. I mean, that's they're worth that, and they know that yeah. if they are part of your album, that you will get more attention and you sell more copies, etc. So. Yeah. And uh, well, I won't ask you for the for the price tags, um, <laughs> but you said uh, Tom Baker, um, another hero of you. Did you say, well, it was for me a dream come true working now with him or her on this album. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, uh, of course, it's it's got Dee Schneider, which is, I think, after Tom Baker, the, the biggest name. I mean, everyone knows him from We're Not Gonna Take It with Twisted Sister in the, in the 80s and stuff like that. Uh, I have to admit, I wasn't a Twisted Sister fan. It wasn't my kind of music. But nevertheless, I, I loved him. You know, he was such a character and so well-spoken and uh, such charisma and such a powerful voice as well. You know, and I was I always thought it was a shame that he didn't do different kind of music, maybe, you know, <laughs> so uh, th so he was high on my list for for the part of the evil, overbearing father, which is kind of funny, you know, because all in all his 80s videos, he was against all that. And now he's the overbearing father himself. <laughs> yeah. So that what was, was it a like cool to twist. Him? What is it like to meet him? I did not meet him. No, no. He uh, he only had to do one song. So obviously he's not going to come all the way from New York to sing one song. No, but so I mean, he, having 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 contact with him and maybe did you speak to him like we are speaking now, Zoom or something? No, no, I, uh, it was all quite brief. It was all through managers and stuff. These guys are shielded off, you know. They're big names. They're shielded off very well. So I had very short contact with him, which is a shame, really, you know, because... Of course, I prefer to have these guys in my studio, and and to uh, but 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 he's such a professional, you know, and and uh, so that wasn't necessary in his case. No, no, no. The thing is that he that he wanted to wanted to participate says that 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 he sees you as something well, worthwhile. Totally, totally. You know, because he the manager also said like he gets so many people asking him for for stuff, so many requests, and and he rarely does it. He really has to like it. I mean, a guy like that doesn't have to do it for 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 the for the, for the money. No. You know, he uh, he. I think he wrote a Christmas song for Celine Dion or whatever. You know, that's enough to keep you to tide you over for for the rest of your life, I guess. <laughs> keep you happy. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, well, Didi Snyder, well, then, uh, I don't know, for me, two guitar heroes, um, maybe of yours, uh, Joe Satriani and Marty Friedman. Let's start off with Joe Satriani. Uh, what was it like for you to, well, to have him on the album? That's really a great story because uh, I had this song with Dee Snyder and I was like, it would be so cool to have another big name playing a guitar solo on it. And it's, I needed a wild guitar solo and I can't do that myself. I'm a limited guitar player. I could play like Gilmore melodic stuff. So I wanted like a really wild guitar player. So Satyani was the first who came to mind and, and Steve Vai uh, and the Ingrid Momsen. I think I had those three on my list. Um, but not Eddie Van Halen? Uh, I, I didn't think I would be able to get him. So there's some of these guys where I'm like, I'm not even going to try, you know, <laughs> but uh, I had a way in with these three people. So that's, that's, uh, 
Uh, I, I knew the, uh, or a, a journalist told me, uh, uh, the, uh, gave me the address of his manager, of uh, Joe Satriani. Yeah. So I contacted him and I said, well, this is a song. And, and, uh, and the manager said the same thing. He said, you know, he gets so many requests and he rarely does something, you know, so don't hold your breath, don't wait for it, but I'll show it to him anyway. And I was like, thanks, you know, and I'll, let's try the, the next one. And three days later, I got an email from Joseph, whatever. And I was like, who's this? <laughs> I clicked on it. And it was, hey, Arjen, uh, I really enjoyed the part you sent me. And I played a solo straight away, like three days later. And I was like, huh? and I listened to it. And it was amazing and everything I hoped for. And I, I was like, well, you know, should I negotiate with your manager? Or how does it work? And he was like, no, no, I love doing it. It's a present. Here you go. It's oh, that's for great. You. <laughs> that's great, great. Did he, did he know you? I mean, do you know that he did he know you from previous work or was it? Uh, you never know. Yeah, I never know. Uh, did he say something about it? I, I don't think so. No, I don't think he, he knew me. No. And then Marty Friedman, the classic Me Megadeth uh, lineup uh, at the end of the, 80s, right. early, the early 90s. Um, what what's what's so specific about his style that you wanted to include him? Well, I had the crazy wild solo, and then I had another song which had like a really jazzy part and a long end part, which was which needed melody and virtuosity. So I needed a combination of both. So again, I made a list, um, and Marty Friedman was high on the list. And luckily, uh, the uh, boss of my record label, Moskot, he knew him personally, he had worked with him. So I had a way in straight to him, not via manager. Oh, yeah. So uh, so I sent him the tracks and uh, <clears throat> his his response was kind of funny. He was like, I listen to your music, Iron, and it's very strange, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, give me some time because it's a long solo and it's kind of complicated. But again, I think he said, within a week or, or maybe a bit more, he already sent me the track and, and he really worked on it, you know. I think Satriani was like, ah, put it on, play the solo and ready. But but I, you could hear he, he has a real story in his solo and, and it's it starts very melodic. In fact, the first few notes have been in my head for it's been in my head for, and it will be again now, I guess, yeah. for months and uh, but then also you have the virtuosity and, and the combination of that. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, then the main characters, of course, um, you worked with Tommy. Um, right, yeah. What makes him, when you said earlier in this conversation, you said he had to look good and he had to act, blah, 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 blah. Um, right. What was your decision to ask him? He was my first choice. He and Simone Simons, like... Yeah. Yeah, two beautiful people, two people with a lot of uh, experience acting video clips and stuff like that, uh, with charisma and great singers. So they had it all. So those two, I were like, I have to have these two people in my in my story. And actually, um, they they were the main characters. Uh, Tommy was was the the rich man's son, and um, Simona was the servant, the poor servant. Um, but then I heard Cami Gilbert uh on a compilation album i think and she, i think she was doing i always mix those up wider shade of pale or or yeah or yeah i think it was wider shade of pale cover and it was so so fantastic so i looked it up on youtube and i saw she was a black girl and and i uh, uh and i contacted her i said i love your voice and luckily she knew me she was even a fan of my music together with her uh, boyfriend the drummer yeah. and um, I explained the story to her I said well what do you think if you would play the main part because you know it, it makes the story so much more interesting in the 19th century and then an interracial forbidden relationship and she totally got that she said oh yes I, I totally agree and I have no problems with that in, in fact I, I like it so uh, so then I had to find a new part for Simone, of course. <laughs> and that's how I came up with the Angel of Death. So and the, but did 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 Simona know that you well had to switch parts for her? Uh I, I'm not sure really. <laughs> I, I know in the beginning I, I asked her, do you want to be on and she said yes. But I think her part is is a very, very much a main part as well. Yeah. 
she's very important in the story and also uh, as you may have seen she she's uh, she has the lead role in in two of the video clips that we uh, we did i think she has a very important part in the story what do you like about her voice simone uh it's it's well uh, i i like her whole persona because when you see her in epica it's uh, she's very serious and very operatic but always when she comes to my studio to record, she's always laughing and she's just the glimmer in her eye and she's always joking like little naughty jokes and stuff like that. And I wanted to highlight that aspect right. of her because people don't know it. And uh, I knew she would do a great job, you know, with the acting and with the hello there and the, uh, nice, you know, <laughs> all these little things. Uh, so it's it's this, uh, the sound of her voice. That's always when I pick singers. It's for me. It's not can they sing or can they sing high or do they have a vibrato? No, it's the sound of the voice. I have to like. Yeah. I love the sound of her voice, and I love that. That uh, I work together with her really well. So I really always want to have her in the studio, uh, and and like together we we always come up with great melodies and with great twists and stuff like that. Yeah. And. Um, your own role. What? 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 On 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 the album, music-wise. What did you? Because you well, you play you play guitar, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Did you do something differently, maybe, in if you if you compare your role to previous albums? Very much so. Yeah, I, I wanted uh, I wanted everything to be different, and I wanted this to be a very organic album, and I wanted to have a lot of new instruments, and. Um, it's a horror movie, you know, so you need a toy piano. <laughs> so I just went to ball.com, ordered a toy piano for 70, 70 euros and I have to learn to play it, of course. You can't program it. <laughs> yeah. And the same with glockenspiel, just a yeah. uh, 100 euro glockenspiel and learn to play it and stuff like that. So yeah, there are a lot of new instruments on this album, like, like Hurdy Gurdy, uh, there's trumpet and trombone, which I never did before. There's a, a real horn player uh etc etc and well the story you you really well have lived the story now for several years of course already um yeah. you start out with uh well uh creating the story and then you work with it with all those characters um yeah did did the story change for you i mean did it did it really uh hit you or struck you while recording and making it it constantly changed. And the weird thing is it changed because of my choice of singers. Like the story changed because I heard Cammy, you know, and suddenly there's a black servant and uh, okay, I got to find a new part for, for Simone because Transitus, the whole Transitus part wasn't in the story. It was just a ghost story in the 19th century. And then suddenly I had, well, maybe Daniel dies and he, he arrives in limbo and, um, so yeah, that's because of Simone that there is yeah. uh, this whole transitus part. Uh, and uh, for, uh, you have, there's also uh, a part, uh, a song called Dumb Piece of Rock, which is again, like a comic uh, relief <laughs> kind of track. And uh, it's about a statue that comes to life. And it's one of my favorite singers. And I swore that I'd, I'd uh, have him on every album. I wanted him on, include him on every album. So I had to think of a part of him for him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's weird how that works the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also a comic uh, with the, uh, well, with the, uh, with the LP. Um, right. What do you, what are your thoughts? Because you said, well, it started out as a movie, it's still hanging in there a movie or maybe a musical. What are your plans? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, uh, uh, when I had the movie plans, I thought I'm bold, you know, I always go straight. I go to Satriani, you know, and <laughs> I go to Bruce Dickinson and Tom Baker. And I thought movie wise, who is my favorite actor? Uh, sorry, uh, director in Holland. And I loved the lift, you know, I was such a big fan of the lift. And later on, of course, you had Amsterdam and you had, uh, uh, Flodder on TV and it, it, uh, it was a big mass, of course, who, who's not afraid to color outside the lines. I don't know if that's an English expression, but, <laughs> you know, he's not afraid to experiment. He, he, he's, he does his own thing. So I contacted Dick Maas. I thought, what the hell? And, and again, you know, I, I sent him a, a lot of links. And a couple of hours later, I got a mail back. And literally it said, 
Jesus, man, you make such cool music. Tell me more. And uh, since then, I've had a, a lot of meetings with Dick. And we went to Amsterdam to meet him. And uh, he was present during the, the video shoot. Uh, he was consultant, basically. So, yeah, he's very into it. He explained me how, how it works with the movie, like with, like with the funding and like producers and, and, and et cetera, building sets, stuff like that. Um, he even wrote a book about it. Uh, Buurman, wat doet u nu? <laughs> Which is, of course, about uh, Tatiana. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's in. And uh, we have a meeting uh, in a week with, uh, with funding and with a producer and with a director. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's still... Uh, the, the plan is still out there. And, of course, it, will, it won't be easy. You know, it, it will at least cost a couple of million. Uh, but it's looking good. It's looking good. There are uh, it's great, great progress. Great, yeah, great, yeah. Arjen. It's really great to hear. Um, must be some 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 dream come true if it happens. Oh, I, a movie would be my ultimate dream come true. You know, <laughs> and I, I wouldn't want to be too involved in it because I don't know too much about it. You know, music wise, I'm I'm the control freak and everything goes my way. But but the movie, I would be like, you know, Dick Mouse knows so much more about it. Uh, so I, I would give them free reign to 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 uh, even change the story, even change the music, whatever you know. Of course, I want to be involved and help, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be uh, yeah okay, in the then cinema then, crying. Uh, <laughs> and then a musical, because I think this is also something that that's really well. You have the basics now for a musical too. Well, basically, that's that's the way it, it went with Jessica Superstar. First, it was the album in, in 1970 with with, with uh, Ian Gillen as Jesus. Then it became a movie with Ted Neely, and then you you know you got the theater uh, and the musical. Uh, so so that would be my dream, you know, the, yeah. the same path. First the album, then the movie, then the theater. So yeah, one can dream. <laughs> What is your last question? What is your timeline for this uh, movie and then maybe uh, theater? What is your timeline? Oh, I don't have a timeline. I, I, I guess these things just take time. You know, you have to get the funding together and, and the actors and, and the producers and the cameramen, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I'm sure that takes a lot of time. I'm sure that takes at least a year to set it up and then making the movie itself will cost at least a couple of months. Yeah. So uh, I I really don't have a timeline. As long as it happens, I'm fine with everything. Right, and then last question, because last year you did a live concert. Do you think this album also will be, when once Corona is over, will also be something that you might perform live? Uh, definitely, it lends itself well for a live performance. Uh, having said that, I would rather uh, do an older album that people have had plenty time to live with. Like we did Electric Castle Life after 20 years, you know, and people grew up with that album and they knew every inch of it. So coming to a show is so special, you know. It's the same with War of the Worlds. If you see that live now, it's something you grew up with. And last question, but, yeah. what, what, what album would you, would you be willing to do then? Sorry? Oh, uh, well, uh, Electric Castle was kind of like a... A, a light, uh, mm -hmm. more of a light show, you know, there was a lot of humor and, and a lot of uh, atmospheric parts. So for the next one, I would want to do something more darker, a bit more industrial, a bit, bit heavier and shit like that. So it would be, uh, I, I'm not going to say which album, but uh, maybe fans can guess. <laughs> great. Okay. Um, Arjen, thank you for your time. Um, and good luck, of course. And well, I, I, I sincerely hope that the meeting with Dick Maas and the funding will, uh, yeah. will, will succeed. Yeah, I hope so too. It's, uh, I'm very nervous. <laughs> Great. But, um, yeah. Thanks again, and uh, we'll stay in touch.